Every consumer and every business person cares about privacy and the impact of privacy breaches are considerable on all of us. So today on episode number 298 of CXO Talk, that is our topic. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Now, before we begin, subscribe on YouTube. I want you to tell your friends, call them up, invite them, invite your family, subscribe on YouTube. Without further ado, I'm very thrilled to welcome our guest today, Mike Palmer is the Executive Vice President and Chief Product Officer of Veritas. Hey, Mike, how are you? And thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. And I am uh, doing great sitting here in Madrid, Spain, actually, uh, enjoying a bunch of client visits. Madrid is a lovely city and uh, lucky you to be there this summer. I agree wholeheartedly. So, Mike, tell us about Veritas. Veritas has been around for a few decades. We are the leading market provider of data protection and storage, uh, software-defined storage services. We're about a $2 billion company. Uh, we are uh, global. Uh, we service customers uh, across the world uh, and have been enjoying uh, working in that industry for 30 plus years. Uh, Mike, and you're chief product officer, and what does that mean you do? I have a few different responsibilities here. Uh, you know, foremost among them is setting the product roadmap, understanding uh, where customers' needs are going, and uh, obviously keeping a pulse on industry trends, as I know you do as well. Uh, I also have responsibility for our, our engineering teams, uh, pricing, and product marketing. So you're responsible for the product roadmap, and you spend a lot of time with customers and you are responsible for engineering and presumably bringing these pieces together shortens the pathway between what the customers want and the products that you're ultimately building. It certainly is our intent to make that so. You know, one of the beauties working in software is it, it, it's one of the best industries to really incorporate uh, customer feedback quickly and, and try to get value to them, you know, in, in ever uh, faster release cycles and being able to work that from the product marketing angle all the way through the engineering delivery is a real privilege. Now, Mike, we're talking about data privacy, and I think it's, uh, you know, on the surface, it's okay, well, just don't give away your information, right? So it's pretty right. fairly trivial. And yet, it's actually a very complex problem. And so maybe you can share with us, what are the components of data privacy? Where, where do some of these complexities arise from? Yeah, and you know, data has is, is been a topic for many, many years, and uh, many of our customers at times uh, confuse or often speak of security and data governance in the same sentences. And for the most part, they're very different topics. You know, where security started was from a very preventative mindset, you know, in terms of uh, keeping the bad guys out or so to speak. And we got very good at things like networking and firewalling and policy controls for access. When we think about data governance, we have a much more complicated problem. We have to understand the data that we're storing, the type of data that it is, its use patterns, uh, a very evolving landscape uh, in the regulatory market, if you will, uh, with data privacy laws covering certain countries or certain industries. Uh, those laws are proliferating and trying to get into the data itself and find almost what looks to be like a needle in the haystack and then creating policy for managing data on that basis is very difficult for most businesses. So the issue of uh, privacy, data privacy, then ultimately uh, is one of governance? I believe it's one of governance. Obviously, that uh, is an easy thing to say and a very hard thing to do because governance starts with visibility. Many companies struggle to even understand what they're storing. They've struggled with that for many years, but it often came from more of a cost management point of view rather than really trying to understand the depths of the information or data that is being stored. Now you have uh, significant growth in what's called unstructured data. So this is data that wasn't easily organized into tables with rows and columns and headers to make it very clear to the user what data is there. We're seeing uh, proliferation in use cases like the Internet of Things, obviously file servers that are dating back many years. You have companies trying to move to the cloud, uh, but at the same time being caught in regulatory frameworks that they don't understand in many cases having to look at data that's been sitting uh, stale for many years as well. So governance is starting with a very basic visibility problem. 
And of course, from there, it goes to even harder problems like classification and policy management uh, at, at a time when companies are trying to cut costs and really trying to automate a lot of this process. So there's a, a very detailed chain that must be in place from beginning to end in order to ultimately ensure that data privacy is maintained. And, and that chain often starts with uh, some of the first links that were put onto it. When you think back to uh, what archiving data has meant for so many years has been taking active data, pushing it off to tape somewhere, uh, allowing a truck to cart it off to some storage facility and more or less forgetting about it at that point that that data is now come into question, you know, in terms of the regulatory frameworks impacting it, uh, whether there's personally identifiable information there. Uh, regulators are increasingly interested in understanding how that's being managed and controlled. Of course, at the same time, you have a lot of opportunity with that data. The chains now extend all the way to the use of, of, of data. So we're looking at more and more companies that are trying to amass this data and do better analytics with it. They're no longer looking for general trends. They're trying to, for example, find targeted marketing opportunities, which means not uh, generalizing the data, but often looking at the specific abnormal parts of the data, if you will, or the abnormalities in the data. So the chain goes from decades old tapes all the way through very modern data analytics techniques and everything in between. And, you know, the obvious question then is what should companies be doing about this? How do you grapple with the problem? This is something that we all struggle with, to be very frank. And there are very few uh, customers that have figured this out. And there are very few suppliers that have an end-to-end -end answer. What we talk most about with the customers that, that we deal with is that uh, visibility as the starting point. And typically for customers, that often means the challenge of very, very heterogeneous architectures. You know, they're working with storage and applications that have been in the data center for decades, all the way through applications they're deploying to SaaS providers or, or buying from SaaS providers is deploying in cloud. Uh, how, do, how do these customers start with the idea of creating some sort of orchestration framework that gives them visibility into data across all of these systems? And not just visibility, but in-depth visibility. Uh, not that they have data and that uh, a particular user touches it, but rather What's in that file? Is there financial information? Is there a social security number, an email address? And then of course, you have to figure out how to do that at scale. It's not just about the heterogeneity, it's petabytes worth of data uh, at a time when data, the creation of data is still accelerating. So visibility really is kind of the first step for many of, of at least our customers, you know, in the process of getting to data governance. Given the importance of visibility, can you elaborate on what do you mean by visibility? Make that more specific for us. You know, one of the challenges that, and, and I'll start with our CIO friends out there, one of the challenges that CIOs have, uh, just to understand what's in the storage architecture, typically is a process of going to uh, a storage engineer and, and asking them to produce, you know, a, a reasonable summary typically given to you in some sort of CSV file that tells you, you know, on this line, I've got this amount of data. It's been there for a certain amount of time, and I think it's associated with these applications. Uh, then they have to follow the chain back to the application owner, figure out what it is that that application did and how critical is that data, often then going to some sort of, uh, let's say, governance uh, institution, let's say, at a bank and understanding, well, what kind of regulatory framework applies to that data. And, and this challenge just uh, makes it very difficult to create uh, an opportunity to, to make quick decisions. Uh, many of the customers that I talk to struggle with the very basic question of delete. Just the, what data can I delete? And there's so many people involved in that decision-making chain, to go back to that metaphor, that most companies have just sort of abandoned it over time and just decided that storage prices are dropping, so I'm just going to keep everything. Of course, that's changing now with, uh, with the laws changing. But that, that basic challenge from a CIO of just understanding, I'd rather you know, be able to look at, let's say, a, just a basic graphical web interface. I'd like to be able to see not what a LUN is, because maybe I don't even know what that is anymore. I just like to understand my applications, the users, the data on them. If it's personal information, what kind of personal information is it? Uh, maybe getting sophisticated and understanding what countries it's stored in and what are the laws associated with that data so that you can start to see the basis of policy execution and policy enforcement. So I think uh, Veritas, along with a number of other companies, are really trying to uh, expose the data that are inside of these systems, 
Try to make it more real. When I say real, more understandable to the end user of an application rather than simply to an infrastructure provider inside the application uh, supply chain. All right. So you've got now greater visibility. You know where your data is being stored. You have a better sense of the type of data that's being stored. But even, I mean, just, just getting to that point seems extremely non-trivial to me. I actually think it's the hardest part. Uh, you know, I have a history of providers that have not necessarily been the most forthcoming with open standards in terms of uh, access protocols, for example. Uh, so it's a lot of work to stitch together the, the pieces that are in the data center and often now not in the data center. Uh, you know, we've talked for a long time in the post mainframe world of the complexity of managing client server and network and SAN and NAS environments. But of course, that's nothing compared to what we're now engaging with, where a lot of the data is stored with third-party providers. Some of those providers have robust governance, some of them less so. Uh, and now that's just simply being added to the history. Very few customers that I know have abandoned client server. They've got a history of physical, they've got virtual, they've now got cloud and SaaS, they've got mobile, they have IoT endpoints. So visibility is a simple thing to say. It's probably the very hardest thing to do but it's the most important one because it is the basis for decision-making thereafter. All right, so now let's wave our magic wand and we have uh, a reasonable level of visibility. At least we're, we're trying. Mm -hmm. But what does that now do for us? Because, okay, we're aware that we have this data, but how does that actually help us protect uh, the, the privacy of users? You know, and, and while we talked about visibility just being awareness, as I think is a great word, uh, there's a much deeper level problem out there. And as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, where we're seeing such a uh, significant growth rate in unstructured data, all the tools that visibility would have been augmented by, you know, in terms of being able to understand what's in the database and, and querying that database, uh, those are not there in the unstructured world. So we're amassing large amounts of data, increasingly collecting uh, consumer information, employee information, uh, where embedded inside of this unstructured data file are going to be all kinds of uh, nuggets, you know, and, and they're nuggets from an analytics point of view, when you want to understand, you know, where your, cons where your consumer's buying habits are, where they're living, you know, what their credit card information might be, so you can store that uh, and use it for future uh, better user experiences. But at the same time, if you're collecting it and you're not classifying this unstructured data, you're inevitably storing it and by default, uh, at risk of not being compliant with the laws surrounding it. So if you are one of those uh, European institutions or American institutions operating in Europe that are being told that you have to be forthcoming with your consumers and your employees about how your data is being treated, or often having to show them upon request how it is being treated and, and potentially having to dispose of it, you have to reach into this mass of unstructured data and as I said earlier, start to find those needles in the haystack. So we talk a lot about classifying data when, you, when it hits storage so that you keep an index and that you, you can query that index without having to troll through petabytes of data to go find those needles. And so classification is kind of the close cousin to visibility and a necessary one if you're going to create some form of software-driven automation uh, in terms of policy enforcement. Okay, so actually, we, we think that we've got a handle on the visibility of the data, and then we start to realize that, wait a second, this onion is more complicated than we thought because we've got all of these additional data sources and data is coming at us from directions that, say, we in IT were not even aware of. That's right. You know, and, and I, I use a, an example uh, regularly with customers of ours who um, are looking to replace the tape, for example, with the object store style technologies where they feel like they're getting much better scale in terms of cost. Uh, they're getting reasonable access patterns for applications that want to query and interact with the object store. One of the complications, and this is a complication I talk to uh, or I speak about often with our cloud service provider partners as well, you know, is that uh, when I start putting things into these object stores, what I'm getting back is something often as nebulous as an object ID. I'm not getting information about what the content is. I'm not getting information about what application it came from. In many respects, I'm getting less information back than I used to have. So when we think about this uh, peeling of the onion, even some of the newer technologies have, are, are finding the need to incorporate things like content classification 
into their otherwise storage driven software purposes so that we don't make the problem worse over time. That we start recognizing that the storage isn't storage, it's more use now. There are, there are very few uh, customers that I speak to that really just want to store data and never touch it again. Increasingly, they want to provide open access. For that, they need to be able to provide information. They need to be able to understand what types of users can or cannot use it or where they can give them or cannot give them access. So it is a very, very difficult process. And with, as you said earlier, this growth of data and these multiple data sources, it's not a process that we can put a, a people-driven solution in place for. So the solution then has to ultimately involve a combination of technology to manage it on the front end. But you spoke earlier about uh, policy and decision making and so and, and regulatory compliance. And so where do these layers come into play? And, and these are difficult labels, layers to, to incorporate, obviously. And one of the things that uh, customers uh, talk a lot of, to us about, and I think uh, we've seen the trend over the past 20 years as well in the industry, is open standards. You know, the ability to take data and information, uh, as well as the technology standards basis, and be able to really extend that through an API, uh, through a, a queryable index, through something that can be shared with an external entity, you know, a lot of the, the technology world needs to sort of step up with these open standards efforts so that uh, they can help. You know, really, that, that's the starting point is let me help you by understanding what's there in the first place, uh, where we're seeing a lot of collaboration between public cloud providers and traditional uh, data center providers along the lines of adoption of things like the S3 protocols, for example, so data can then move easily back and forth. Uh, we have efforts on the cloud provider part of creating indices for their uh, storage so that that can be queryable again by, by customers that are probably sitting also with a private data center. These are all kind of piece parts that are, uh, some of which are mature, some of which are, are really more of a, a challenge to integrate, but that's where a lot of the technology effort is going these days. I see, and where does uh, regulatory compliance then intersect with all of this? You know, and so we're seeing more and more tools, and of course, Veritas being one of these providers, they're building uh, regulatory frameworks directly into their storage and archiving products so that you'd be able to uh, do something as simple as check a box, you know, inside of a storage device or inside of an archive product and say, you know, I need to be MIFID compliant because I'm a European bank. And as such, here are uh, four opportunities to analyze data and look for a risk profile. Uh, these software products can, can go through data sets and help you understand whether you have certain types of customer information that might likely sit inside of them, it can highlight the files that has that information so you can go back and look manually if you feel like you wanna add a greater level of oversight. But this is what I said earlier, you know, storage is really kind of moving away from being storage and it's more this concept of use, which makes them a, a higher order set of products and tools that can literally embed uh, frameworks directly into them. And what about GDPR? You know, and GDPR just being one of those frameworks. And, uh, you know, we in the industry talk a lot about uh, GDPR because it was fairly novel, you know, when it was uh, promulgated as a law. And of course, it's just come into force this year uh, in May. But if you look at the law, it really doesn't ask you to do much more than a well-governed company should have been doing anyway. Uh, it does add some complexity. Uh, of course, uh, this idea of a subject access request where uh, an individual private citizen can call your company up and ask to understand how their data is being treated or potentially be deleted adds a significant level of complexity for many, many companies uh, who would have you know, gladly given that ability to a marketeer working for the company if they had had it, are now having to rethink how they store data, how they can search across their data silos. They're having to think a lot more about uh, cloud adoption you know, and where cloud data might be replicated or should not be replicated to. So these are all kind of concepts embedded into GDPR that are impacting the technology industry. Uh, we think that customers are starting to really act uh, more this year on some sort of execution around GDPR. We'll say that it wasn't as much last year as we thought it would have been. But at the same time, I, I believe like many laws, there was a lack of clarity in what enforcement was going to look like, what were the standards really going to be. And dare I say, you know, there are many companies that are out there waiting for the first 
uh, victim, if you will, at some level of, of uh, a regulatory enforcement action to understand what the boundaries are going to look like. You know, for GDPR also creates uh, a tremendous amount of business complexity. Let me just give you an example. So, so we do business with a major company in Germany, and so that and we've that and we have for many years. And so we had to sign a lengthy GDPR contract, basically an, an audit. And it has to be signed, and we had to physically send the document back to them. And now, every time we do a project, there are, in addition to the, all the SOW and all of the standard contract stuff, there's now this GDPR component, and it's, it's intrusive, and it slows things down, and it's just a, a, a real pain. Uh, I agree with you, you know, and, and uh, like so many new laws, or frankly, to be fair to the law, like so many new activities or behaviors or policies, the first, you know, 100 days, 300 days are uh, often rife with inefficiencies in terms of how to execute the process. We have a, an industry that is trying to digitize. And at the same time, we have a new law that maybe isn't as friendly, you know, when it comes to the standards of enforcement. Like you said, you have paper going back and forth and signatures and a, and a bunch of things that really should have been embedded into the actual software itself and often you know provide the opportunity for uh, more automated uh, reporting and auditing. But I do believe as we look at the next one, two, and three years, a lot of these ideas are, are simply going to fade into the background as they become part of the new norm. They're going to be embedded into the application process. They will be embedded into the, uh, even into the very data fabric that uh, enforces data movement or prevents data movement. And I think in particular as cloud providers uh, realize that there, there is a part to be played as infrastructure providers and helping customers understand what's being stored there, collaborating with companies like ours as well, uh, that the tools will come into place for, for enterprises to enforce this more readily. So, so essentially GDPR uh, will become standard, all the, or the pieces of GDPR will become standard operating procedure, and it will companies will sort of grapple with it in a in a just easier way, I guess is the way to put it. Like all things, I think they'll get better at it over time. You know, one of the challenges for many of these companies is that it's not going to stop with GDPR. I wonder a little bit sometimes whether we'll even be talking about GDPR in two years, because there will be many more data privacy laws passed. They will be amended. Uh, companies will constantly be responding to them. You know, we saw California pass a, a, a law that's not dissimilar to GDPR. And in fact, many believe is a, a more strict enforcement standard than GDPR even and brought into an effect. You have uh, countries uh, in Asia that are looking at GDPR as a model, but inevitably will uh, pass a law that is similar but different. What's I think going to uh, come out of all of this is that enterprises will end up having to take the lead on what data governance is, that the law will be the, uh, the foundational uh, aspect of it. They'll get better than what the law requires, uh, mostly because uh, they will really wanna use this data more effectively, not just because they're afraid of the enforcement action. So I think GDPR might fade into the background. We'll see other laws in the, in the meantime, but uh, the importance of data as kind of the new currency uh, for businesses to thrive is going to ultimately drive a very different set of behaviors anyway. Uh, technology will rise to the occasion as it's done over the past you know, decades for us, and it'll just be the new norm. Mike, you mentioned earlier that um, data governance, that, that GDPR is really the way a well-managed business should be running anyway. Can you elaborate on that? Well, we all know that, that companies, uh, well, I guess there's the old expression, right? Reputation is the hardest thing to earn and the easiest thing to lose. And the most precious thing that most companies uh, base their reputation on is uh, their stewardship over their customer data. And they're asking for more of it uh, than they ever have before. They're collecting information, not just on the traditional transactions and not just using that data more effectively and uh, more comprehensively than in the past, they're also collecting it in more places. Uh, they're collecting it in places often where customers don't realize, whether that's in the background of a mobile app or it's uh, the physical uh, understanding that a consumer's entered into a store and that their 
uh, their, their mobile ID has been picked up by a local Wi-Fi router. So they, they're, they're looking at ways to understand customers. They're collecting more of this data. That's increased the need for better stewardship. And as such, if they're going to be thriving brands, you know, that, that ultimate goodwill aspect of any cost, uh, company's uh, valuation, they're going to have to defend the knowledge and the right as, as to what they're doing with this data. They're going to have to anyway be able to respond to users that do have concerns and show that they are good stewards because they can respond quickly, uh, that they can provide a level of confidence, that they're not subject to you know, some of the numbers, not just of breaches, but just uses of the data that make consumers uncomfortable. This is just going to be part of good business practice. So as data proliferates, this simply the, the issues grow and companies will deal with it. Now, I know you did a survey recently of consumers, and so it might be interesting to hear about that because it draws the link between the infrastructure of data and governance that you were describing earlier with the ultimate business impact. Well, we know that consumers uh, are, are more concerned than ever about how their data is being treated. And they understand that they want some trade-off between the benefit of having given their data over to a, to a company and the benefit they're going to receive in response to it. They are going and increasingly going to hold these enterprises accountable uh, almost in a transaction-like way where they've understood and the transparency of understanding that their data is being collected and used uh, is there for them. And under those conditions, there seems to be a great willingness for consumers to give data to enterprises. But like any other good business uh, person would do, this consumer is also understanding that there's a benefit conferred back to them. Uh, whether that benefit is a service, uh, like so many other free services have offered to them, uh, at times it will be you know, basically in the form of payment, which is something that I don't think any of us should be surprised to see in the future, that there would be some sort of transaction offered for the better and, and appropriate use of, of consumer data. By the way, I think this, uh, this issue exists on the other side as well. You know, one of the more, for me, fascinating ideas uh, of company valuation comes down to an understanding of a balance sheet. You know, we uh, have talked to a lot of customers who, who uh, really understand this metaphor where, you know, companies are valued by the assets that they have, you know, their income statements, the profits that they generate. But a lot of the companies that are the most valuable ones in the world now, uh, the, if you ask somebody, what's the most valuable thing they have? And I'm thinking the Facebooks and the Googles of the world, there isn't one person that wouldn't say that data is the most valuable thing that this company has. But as an investor, there is no way to actually value that data. You can't go to the balance sheet. They don't report on the volume of data they've collected. They don't even report on how much it costs to keep it or the risk it creates to have it. And this idea on the enterprise side uh, very well could evolve to be some form of accounting standard where companies that base their business models on the appropriate and the effective use of data will have to find a way uh, to defend its value, to defend how they've ensured that that uh, data is well taken care of, insured against the risks of having data, and we've seen many of, uh, of the, not just risks, but the actual events that come to fruition in, in the security world. Uh, so this idea is, is also a very interesting one, and it's the enterprise side of, of the value of data that complements the consumer's idea of the value of, uh, of their own data. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting point, because also we've seen, for example, I mean, look at Facebook uh, being dragged in front of Congress all yeah. about the role of, I mean, in politics, it's all right, right? It's all the Russians, it's all about data. But there's, but that's another level, right? Because you have the, the, the care and feeding of the data on the one side, which is I think what you were talking about earlier. And now on the other side, you have how are corporations using that data that is in trust, theoretically entrusted to them? Well, this is right, you know, we, there are still even basic problems in the data industry and one that most financial institutions and, and frankly, most large institutions will be familiar with is just discoverability. There are uh, difficulties that large enterprises have even understanding email and where email is being uh, stored. Uh, you have users that have been and many years have had the ability to, to copy email files to various places inside of their company. Of course, a, a lawsuit comes around and all of a sudden, this institution has email risk where it thought it had none. Because an email file that they thought they had deleted at one time, in fact, had been copied to another place, 
and now is a discoverable item that in and of itself could change the whole outlook for, for a legal case for them. And that's what we would have considered to be kind of basic management. Uh, when we get into more sophisticated use cases, you think about the advent of analytics and really uh, optimizing for, from the enterprise perspective, optimizing the use of time series data, understanding not just that you were a consumer, but much more detailed information about what exactly your behavior was at the t and a time and place that you were, uh, what the outcome of that situation was. And in some cases, it can even be data that's transmitted through a third party. So your data is now residing with a company where you had no direct uh, relationship, but is taking advantage through a third party provider or some sort of data-like relationship where they're using your data to enrich their data sets. So the, the world is changing quickly in, in this space. Uh, we do think that, as we've seen from our surveys, that consumers are a little bit more both wary, but also understanding of the fact that uh, the genie is a bit out of the bottle, but that does give an opportunity to start to put some controls around it. Uh, and this is where we go back to uh, facing the complexities of looking into uh, the part of uh, practice and data management that really hadn't evolved all that much until a few years ago. Yeah, you know, it's another interesting dimension of this is the way the challenge of data management influences business behavior. For example, there are many attorneys these days who basically don't use email except for, right. you know, scheduling a meeting. Say, okay, let's, you know, let's have a call Thursday. But they don't write it down. That's right. But at the same time, a lot of these folks uh, are using tools that they don't think of as email-like formats, but are absolutely just like email. And we think about messaging tools, uh, whether those range from the ones on, on your, uh, your mobile device, but also in, in, form, in the form of collaboration tools that are almost built into most enterprise software today. And they are also a record of your communication. They all of a sudden are uh, both exposed to the legal discoverability process but also are part of data that you want to mine for information about uh, not just consumer, but even employee behavior and trying to understand the culture and practices of your own company. So while we move away from one tool because we thought it had risk, we often just move to another. And I think what the, uh, what the industry at large has shown us over the last 20 years is that the demand for communication has increased over time. It has not decreased. The methods have proliferated ranging from this video chat all the way down to the, to the legacy emails. So we're not going to be able to run away from a particular process that we thought was more risky. We typically are running to many more. Uh, so the problem of data management is going to have to evolve to accommodate those processes. Somebody uh, said to me that, that he thinks that companies are mig wanting employees to migrate into tools, collaboration tools like Slack because it makes the data discovery easy, discoverability easier for the enterprise because now, instead of being spread out among texts and emails and whatever else, it's all consolidated in one place. And uh, you know, if, uh, if my Microsoft colleagues were here, they would sort of protest that they have a product called Teams. And just like every other competitive industry, not everyone will coalesce onto a single platform, even within a single company. Uh, and while Slack is a great tool, and by the way, we're, you know, we're users of that here at Veritas as well, we also use a lot of email and we use a lot of other sharing devices as well. You know, as an agile development company, we have a lot of background tools where we share information both with our customers and, and between our engineering teams. You know, again, uh, if we go back 40 years, we all used the telephone. Uh, we probably had basically that in letter writing. Uh, the m sort of the means and mechanisms for talking with each other in, in whatever talking means these days are growing more numerous, not less. I don't think we're going to see platform consolidation anytime soon. Okay, so then is the ultimate, if we, if we kind of net this out then, is the ultimate challenge the fact that the data exists in so many places? Is that simpl oversimplifying? I absolutely believe that is uh, one of, if not the primary challenge facing most CIOs today. Uh, now, Let's also talk about the opportunities because with increased communication, it's just more information and better information and more specific information that we can use to make decisions. So we've seen the rise of the chief data officer, a role that didn't exist 10 years ago. And that person is now wearing this dual hat of how do I help uh, become compliant, but at the same time, maximize the use of my data. 
Uh, we see this at Veritas. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we're we're the world's largest data protection provider. Protecting data is core to this entire conversation. And as a protection provider, we see one of the big challenges is, wow, the, the formats are changing, the tools are changing, where the data is being stored is changing. How do I, uh, how can I go back to yesterday? Even if it's not just because for the classic uh, use case of data being deleted, what if it's for showing a regulator that I came to a particular conclusion with a certain data set using a certain tool and now I have to go defend that? How do I go back to yesterday with my Hadoop cluster, with my Cassandra deployment? So we're seeing opportunity, we're seeing an evolution in the responsibility and the governance that goes along with that. Uh, but certainly a lot of that is being driven by the fact that data is everywhere now uh, and we're increasing the opportunities to collect it. We're changing and increasing the number of places we store it. Uh, and that's forcing us all to evolve quickly. Okay, so so again, just to make sure that I, I understand. So you have the, the data infrastructure and that data, the, the places the data is stored, the sources where this data is coming from, the specific technologies, the devices, and all of that is shifting over time because technology changes all the time. So you have right. that and it's in flux. But then on top of that, you have this data governance layer that then presumably, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but presumably then manages that underlying changing infrastructure so that the people who are making decisions can be insulated from the, the, the changing sources and storage locations of that data. I, I think you've said that well. You know, one of the uh, clear trends in technology over the last 30 years has been the development of what is, I, I think, in a trendy sort of way, referred to as platforms. But if you think about what the underlying driver always was for a platform, it was proliferation in technology. When we all put our data onto a mainframe, we knew where it was, the compute was there, we all logged into the same box. You didn't need platforms. It, there was one platform and it was the mainframe. And when we moved into client server and we saw proliferation of hardware vendors, uh, we needed operating systems. We needed to create some sort of commonality to help us adopt the hardware vendor that we wanted to. And when we saw Java uh, rise, we had the same issue with development platforms. And we saw the J2EE platforms help us scale and abstract development from operating systems. And slowly those faded into the background. And the question that we can ask ourselves now is, if the most valuable thing, and for that matter, the thing for which we have the most responsibility, and maybe the only thing we even own as enterprises now, and by the way, with regulatory, we don't even own it anymore, we are custodians of it, is data. What's the data platform? So as you describe this overlay architecture, I think that is exactly the right way to think about the evolution of a platform in which you can abstract data in terms of your use of it, in terms of your policy enforcement for it, from all of the technology decisions that you're not only making today, but as all of my enterprise colleagues also understand, is that you didn't change, you just added. Because you still have all of those technology choices that you've made over the 30 years, typically still sitting in the same data center. You're now having to manage all of that together. So you're rarely going to get a solution from a particular silo. You need to get a platform solution that spans across those silos. And we think that's where combining rock solid data protection with a very good understanding of visibility and embedding classification in there, and then creating the workflow policy enforcement tools on top, frees customers to give, you know, to make the best technology choices possible, but also gives them the ability to manage data abstracted from those technology choices. Mike, we have not spoken much about the decision making and the the, the policies and the training and also the cultural mindset of how employees in the enterprise relate to that data. So now let's talk about the governance later that we've just been discussing and the, the people who are making use of it, that it is serving. It's a super interesting part of the conversation. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that keeps me sane is I spend a lot of time thinking, where, where are we on the arc of the evolution of, of our industry? You know, and just mentioned that from a platform standpoint, but if we took it from a people orientation, you know, we've seen a lot of change there as well. Uh, you know, we had highly centralized technology teams 20 years ago. 
uh, they've become extremely fragmented these days. You have teams uh, often sitting in lines of business that are very, very technology focused. They're building their own applications on new technology architectures at the same time uh, that we have very centralized uh, functions at many organizations. Uh, sometimes both uh, exist at the same one. And that means that the culture and the mentality of the individual groups will be very different. If I'm sitting in a line of business and I'm trying to get my application out because I'm part of the team to hit a sales target, I have a very specific type of mentality. If I'm sitting in an IT governance organization where I'm overseeing the, the behaviors and the practices of the entire organization, I may have a very different one. I'm gonna be a little bit more possibly conservative. I'm more focused on scale and supportability. I'm more risk averse potentially. I don't want to do a disservice to my, my IT colleagues who are obviously very ambitious, aggressive uh, uh, partners to their business colleagues inside the enterprise as well. But those different groups are definitely going to bring some slant to the way that they think about these things. We see this in cloud most, uh, most recently. Uh, independent development teams that are acquiring, in effect, hardware-based solutions in cloud at the same time, uh, having moved away from some of the support teams that not only supplied them hardware, but supplied them with a lot of support and governance services in the process, all of a sudden aren't part of the process as much anymore. So now we have cloud-based applications that may not have the level of protection that the enterprise is required. In some cases, the enterprise doesn't know that the applications are even there, or better said, that the people responsible for governing them don't know that they're there. Uh, so we're starting to see some fraying you know, in the traditional fabrics that used to hold IT and business and, and governance together. And some of those cultural aspects are starting to be changed. But as I mentioned earlier, we're not gonna be able to do that with people. It's going to hap have to happen with software. It's going to have to happen in more of a software defined data center way. And those tools are just coming to the market now. So it's gonna be, a, I think a very challenging few years for the, the technology users. Now at the same time, I think you mentioned something that's also important. There's a whole new user out there. You know, there is a chief data officer. There's a risk manager. There are marketeers that are looking for more and more data than they uh, were given in the past. They're looking for different types of data. They've now become a user and they want more direct access. They want more direct control. They're very savvy technology people. So the whole idea of self-servicing data is, is now something that is a very significant conversation for a lot of our customers. So they're adding a whole different point of view to the process. They don't do any infrastructure, they don't do any applications, but they want a lot of say over how data is protected, where it's stored, how it's stored, how long it's retained for, and what information they can get about it. Uh, that, that's a very significant shift for most enterprises where 20 years ago, they'd create a transaction, uh, they'd store it, they'd put it off to tape, and they wouldn't have to think about it anymore. So you raise a very interesting point about the cloud providers, because as you're outsourcing the movement of data to somebody else, we think of, we think of cloud as outsourcing uh, the infrastructure, but actually you're outsourcing the control of data. And so in this GDPR world, how can companies manage that? And, and even, and, and let's talk about GDPR, but let's talk about the basics before that. Cloud providers will tell you they are not responsible for data protection at all. It's in your contract. So they expect you as the user of their, in effect, their hardware service, of course, overlaid with other services, but you are the steward of your own data. You are the governing entity. So while they'll do the best uh, that they can to keep their service up and running, uh, the reality is in the end, you're the one that is responsible. So what, challenge number one is, as we have, as you mentioned earlier, different users coming into the picture using these services, how do we train these users to think about uh, the, the 360 degree view of what it means to be an IT provider. And that starts with things like data protection, making sure you can recover data, making sure you understand the kind of data you're putting into any environment, not just a cloud environment, because that's not the primary, men primary mentality that you came to the job with. You often came more with a development mentality or a marketing mentality. So that's job number one. Uh, when we get into more sophisticated issues like GDPR, where now we also have to think about uh, not just is my data protected, can I restore it? Uh, we have to think more specifically about what's in the data in the data, right? It could be the six, nine, 12 character string that is inside the data file that I sent up there that happens to have a social security number in it. And as such, I have very specific rules that my enterprise requires me to follow. 
Now I have to embed that mentality into the process. So I think what we're starting to discover is uh, we'll start to see uh, users that kind of went out there on their own a little bit because cloud enabled them uh, a more ready access to infrastructure to build applications. And that definitely grew and is continuing to grow. We're starting to see an umbrella form over the, the larger data center, the one in which cloud and SaaS providers are part of the core premises based data center. And that those software products, those standards, uh, and even those roles are starting to have a, a light touch, but an important touch into these new groups. Okay, so, I mean, we could go on and on, but there's, there's a lot of complexity into this. So as we, as we finish up, what advice do you have for corporations who are just looking at this and daunted and saying, you know, what do we do? How do we, how do we solve it? Well, you know, I'm coming from a data protection uh, perspective, so I always start the answer to that question there. Uh, and that is, uh, you can outsource hardware, you can outsource applications to SaaS providers, but the number one thing that you will be held accountable to will be data. You've collected the data, you use the data, your reputation is built uh, on the treatment of that data, and the growth of your business is in how you use it. Uh, so protecting data is your foremost responsibility. Uh, so know that you're doing that and know that regardless of how technology changes, the core responsibility has not changed. And whether things go to cloud or they get virtualized or you put them into a container or you have them running on a Hadoop platform, uh, protecting data is something that you have to ask every one of your teams and make sure that that is well enforced. Beyond that, you know, going back to where we uh, discussed earlier, do you have visibility at a business level into your data. That means going to your, your counterparts as a CIO, for example, in, in the chief data office, in the uh, chief regulatory office, to your legal teams, and asking them, how well do they understand the data the enterprise has? And if they don't, do you have an interface for them uh, as non-technologists to be able to not only risk manage the profile of the business, but take advantage of the data that you're collecting as well. And have you enabled them to get that kind of access? Uh, so that visibility and that classification is key. Third is software enablement, right? If your uh, new architectures are not foremost software defined, you will not scale. Uh, data is growing. As we said earlier, the places where it's stored and where it is collected, uh, they're proliferating and that is not going to stop. Software has been solving problems like that for, for many, many years. It's gonna solve this problem as well, but the software first mentality and the open software standards first mentality is going to have to be uh, top of mind. And then last but not least is employ it, right? Policy execution through software that makes people better. And that means allowing them to focus on their core job primarily and not make everything I've set up to this point a, a, an added significant complexity to their job but more a plug into it so that they can feel confident it is protected, that it is classified, that the rules are followed in terms of its treatment while they do what they do best is, is ultimately the right long-term answer. Okay, wow. Well, you have given us a real college level course in <laughs> data protection. Mike, thank you so much for, for taking the time today to be with us. Michael, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having the conversation with me. You have been watching episode number 298 of CXO Talk, and we've been speaking about data and privacy and how, how to make it better. <laughs> I'm Michael Kriegsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Thanks so much, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and check out CXOTalk.com, and we will see you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.